All right, and we will get started. Um, a couple things in the chat there. I'll respond to you in a moment. Um, hello, and welcome to ARCNA 34 Zoom Edition. My name is Matthew, and I am an addict. Please help me open this meeting with a moment of silence for the addict still suffering, followed by the serenity prayer. Everyone will stay muted. Please follow along on your own. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. As I said, my name is Matthew M. I am the host for this workshop, as well as all the other uh, Zoom meetings during this virtual convention. I um, want to get into a couple uh, quick announcements before we actually get into our speakers. First and foremost, while this convention is utilizing both Zoom and YouTube, Narcotics Anonymous as a fellowship does not endorse or support either company or platform. Because this format limits the possibility for complete anonymity, it is up to each individual member to decide what steps they feel necessary to, to, to protect their anonymity, such as removing their last name from their username, turning off their camera if they see fit, and removing the default picture associated with their Zoom account. In addition, this meeting is being broadcast via live stream on YouTube and is going to be able to be reviewed and downloaded. So please be mindful of this as well. In an effort to maximize the security within this platform, the chat function, virtual backgrounds, and all screen sharing options have been disabled. In addition to this, the meeting co-host will be monitoring individual participant video feeds, screen names, and backgrounds. And if anything inappropriate is observed, that user will be removed from the call and will not be able to rejoin. This is to ensure that this convention remains a safe, recovery-focused environment for all participants. Each Zoom meeting will become active 15 minutes prior to the start time to set readers for each meeting and will utilize the waiting room function. In addition, each meeting has a limited number of possible participants. And once the Zoom meeting is full, any additional participants are invited to watch the live stream on YouTube by searching for ARCNA 34 space Zoom. Um, so if anybody's having um, issues with not being able to get in, or if we hit our, cap our uh, cap, um, if you wouldn't mind just passing that information along to anybody, they can follow along right on YouTube. Um, and we'll kind of go from there. Um, another announcement for ARCNA. Let me share this screen real quick. As of right now, ARCNA 34 has been rescheduled to July 31st to August 2nd in Scottsdale, Arizona at the Doubletree Hotel. Um, we have discounted room rates available um, at, this, uh, at this link that is on this flyer. I will put all of this information into the chat as well so that you're able to, uh, to check that out, get registered, look into room rates and, and all that. Um, also, we have some merch, ARCNA 34 bandanas, also dual purpose, COVID screens. Um, I cannot speak to if they're N95 rated or not, um, but they look cool. So if looking cool keeps you from getting COVID, you'll succeed with that. Um, please don't quote me on any of these things. Disclaimer, I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but they are free with a $10 donation to ARCNA. If you are interested in one of these, we are running low on supplies. Shout out to Diana for the amazing graphic design artwork really running with this whole production here. Um, but if you are interested in one, please contact myself. Um, I will put my number in the chat. It is also listed on the flyer for this convention. Um, we can coordinate getting the money sent and getting them sent out to you. So if you're interested, let me know. All right, we begin our meetings with readings from our basic text. Um, I have asked Ryan to read who is an addict? And Maya is going to screen share here. Let me unmute you. And nope, wrong one, sorry. People are joining, there we go. Let's try that one. Come on. There we go, go ahead, Ryan. Ryan addict, who is an addict? Most of us do not have to think twice about this question, we know. Our whole life and thinking was centered in drugs in one form or another, the getting and using and finding ways and means to get more. We live to use and use to live. Very simply, an addict is a man or woman whose life is controlled by drugs. 
We are people in the grip of a continuing and progressive illness whose ends are always the same, jails, institutions, and death. Awesome. Thank you very much, Ryan. Next up, we have Inez reading, what is the NA program? Oops, sorry, people keep joining. There we go. Hello, I'm Inez, I'm an addict from Stockholm, Sweden. NA is a nonprofit fellowship or society of men and women for whom drugs had become a major problem. We are recovering addicts who meet regularly to help each other stay clean. This is a program of complete abstinence from all drugs. There is only one requirement for membership, the desire to stop using. We suggest that you keep an open mind and give yourself a break. Our program is a set of principles written so simply that we can follow them in our daily lives. The most important thing about them is that they work. There are no strings attached to NA. We are not affiliated with any other organizations. We have no initiation fees or dues, no pledges to sign, no promises to make to anyone. We're not connected with any political, religious or law enforcement groups and are under no surveillance at any time. Anyone may join us regardless of age, race, sexual identity, creed, religion or lack of religion. We're not interested in what or how much you used or what your connections were what you've done in the past, how much or how little you have, but only in what you want to do about your problem and how we can help. The newcomer is the most important person at any meeting because we can only keep what we have by giving it away. We've learned from our group experience that those who keep coming to our meetings regularly stay clean. Thank you very much. And let me mute you there. Next up, we have Corey or Diana reading, Why Are We Here? Hi, my name is Diana and I'm an addict. All right. Before coming to the fellowship of NA, we could not manage our own lives. We could not live and enjoy life as other people do. We had, we had to have something different and we thought we had found it in drugs. We placed their use ahead of the welfare of our families, our wives, husbands, and our children. We had to have drugs at all costs. We did many people great harm, but most of all, we harmed ourselves. Through our inability to accept personal responsibilities, we were actually creating our own problems. We seemed to be incapable of facing life on its own terms. Most of us realized that in our addiction, we were slowly committing suicide, but addiction is such a cunning enemy of life that we had lost the power to do anything about it. Many of us ended up in jail or sought help through medicine, religion, and psychiatry. None of these methods was sufficient for us. Our disease always resurfaced or continued to progress until in desperation, we sought help from each other in Narcotics Anonymous. After coming to NA, we realized we were sick people. We suffered from a disease from which there is no known cure. It can, however, be arrested and at some point, recovery is then possible. Thank you, Diana. All right, and next up we have How It Works and we've got Rebecca. I'm Rebecca, I'm an addict. If you want what we have to offer and are willing to make the effort to get it, then you're ready to take certain steps. These are the principles that made our recovery possible. One, we admitted that we are powerless over our addiction, that our lives become unmanageable. Two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. Four, it made a searching and fearless more image of ourselves. Five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we are entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, we humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Now we may direct amends to such, po to such people wherever possible, except when we do so would injure them or others. Then we continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. 11, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and power to carry that out. 12, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to addicts and practice these principles in all our affairs. This sounds like a big order and we can't do it all at once. We didn't become addicted in one day, so remember, easy does it. There is one thing more than anything else that would defeat us in our recovery. <laughs> This is an attitude of indifference or intolerance towards spiritual principles. Three of these that are indispensable are honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. With these, we are well on our way. 
We feel that our approach to the disease of addiction is completely realistic for the therapeutic value of one addict helping another is without parallel. We feel that our way is practical for one addict can best understand and help another addict. We believe the sooner we face our problems within our society and everyday living, just that much faster we become acceptable, responsible, and productive members of that society. The only way to keep from returning to active addiction is not to take that first drug. If you are like us, you know that one is too many and a thousand is never enough. We put great emphasis on this, for we know that when we use drugs in any form or substitute one for another, we release our addiction all over again. Thinking of alcohol as different from other drugs has caused a great many addicts to relapse. Before we came to NA, many of us viewed alcohol separately, but we cannot afford to be confused about this. Alcohol is a drug. We are people with a disease of addiction who must abstain from all drugs in order to recover. And thank you, Rebecca. And lastly, with the 12 traditions, we have Shajan. Shajan, sorry if I mispronounced that. And there you go. I'm addict named Shajan from the South Puget Sound area of Narcotics Anonymous in Olympia, Washington. The 12 traditions of Narcotics Anonymous, we keep what we have only with vigilance. Just as freedom for the individual <clears throat> comes from the 12 steps, so freedom for the group springs from our traditions, as long as the ties that bind us together are stronger than those that would tear us apart. All will be well. One, our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends on any unity. Two, for our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. Three, the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop using. Four, each group should remain autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or any as a whole. Five, each group has but one primary purpose, to carry the message to the addict who still suffers. Six, an NA group ought never endorse finance or lend the NA name to any related facility or outside enterprise, lest problems of money, property, or prestige divert us from our primary purpose. Seven, each group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. Eight, Narcotics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. Nine, NA as such ought never be organized, but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. 10, Narcotics Anonymous has no opinions on outside issues Hence, the NA name ought never be drawn into public controversy. 11, our public relations policy is based on traction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. 12, anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. Understanding these traditions comes slowly over a period of time. We pick up information as we talk to members and visit various groups. It usually isn't until we get involved with service that someone points out that personal recovery depends on NA unity. And that unity depends on how well we follow our traditions. The 12 traditions of NA are not negotiable. They are the guidelines that keep our fellowship alive and free. By following these guidelines in our dealings with others and society at large, we avoid many problems. That is not to say that our traditions eliminate all problems. We still have to face difficulties as they arise, communication problems, differences of opinion, internal controversies, and troubles with individuals and groups outside the fellowship. However, when we apply these principles, we avoid some of the pitfalls. Many of our problems are like those that our predecessors had to face. Their hard-won experience gave birth to the traditions, and our own experience has shown that these principles are just as valid today as they were when these traditions were formulated. Our traditions protect us from the internal and external forces that could destroy us. They are truly the ties that bind us together. It is only through understanding and application that they work. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right. And thank you, everybody, for reading. Um, to donate to our seventh tradition, um, we are using SquarePay. And that's the seventh tradition for Artna 34. Um, I will post the link into the chat. And it is also listed on the YouTube live stream video as well. Um, the topic for this workshop is self expect. Uh, wow, self-acceptance. Can't talk, I'm sorry. Um, each speaker will share for 30 minutes on the topic. And first up, we have a last second replacement. Thank you very much, George, for being of service um, when uh, the original speaker was unable to hop in there. So George, I'm gonna unmute you and go right ahead. Thanks, Matthew. My name's George and I'm an addict. I, um, I appreciate, uh, can you hear me okay? I'm in my truck. I'm not driving, but I'm sitting in my truck. I have the air on a little bit, so I hope you can hear me okay. I um, 
and I thank Laura for, for uh, asking me to share as well. I, I came out to Scottsdale, I think, back in uh, February for um, – I had a meeting in town, and um, I – um, it, things weren't going great anyway, but I have some, some family issues going on, but I stopped in and, uh, just looked it up online, I think, or maybe my sponsor pointed me in the direction. And, uh, I went to a couple of your all's meetings there and it was just fantastic and met you guys and got to go out to eat and that the fellowship. And it was really, really helpful to me at that time. And I had it, uh, picked up, uh, my clean date at that time so i at least got to get a a key tag that night and so it was awesome and uh it was awesome to meet you all dan i appreciate you asking me to share so um it's a great topic fantastic topic um i used because of no self-acceptance you know i know that i i grew up um my the old the earliest memories i had in life was being scared and being uh, not sure of myself. And that was pretty much <clears throat> how my entire world was framed around me, even at maybe 10 years old. I, I don't know, but my earliest memories was that. And um, so, you know, when, when I became, a, I got a little older as a teenager, um, tremendous low self-esteem, esteem, tremendous, uh, lack of knowing who I was and what I wanted to do. And, and, uh, I, I, I know looking around, uh, seeing other people, I would think, well, you know, they have their life together and, uh, they're doing good and they don't have this sort of movie playing inside of their head all the time to try to figure out what it is I'm supposed to be doing so that you will think I'm okay. And you'll think I'm part of whatever crowd you're in and you'll let me be part of whatever crowd you're in and do whatever you're doing. And, um, and that was my life. And, and, it, and I wasn't happy. I had to find something different. And actually for me, it was drugs and, uh, drinking and drugs and connected really well to that. And, um, it sort of got me through. I, I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't found drugs and alcohol really, because I don't think I could have made it without having something to, um, you know, to, to, to break the, the fear and the craziness that was going on in my life. But um, like all good stories we have in here, mine is no different. I, I used and until the point that, that uh, it created more of a problem than it solved. And I used when I didn't want to use and um, I got in a lot of trouble for it. And I started trying to get clean at an early age. I mean, I, I quickly became a very dysfunctional, addicted person. And, um, and so I was in a lot of trouble and, and, and failing out of school and blah, blah, blah. So my family immediately tried to get me some help. And um, at maybe at 22, and uh, I went to treatment. I did certain things. I got introduced to to um, uh, some meetings. One meeting in particular I got introduced to AA. There was only NA in my area. Maybe the closest NA meeting was a couple hundred miles away, um, at least 150 miles away. And so, um, but but and I got a seed planted, and I got and I met people that seemed like they were like me, and I didn't stay but it planted a seed for me. And um, then a year or so later, um, uh, you know, traveling down the road a little bit deeper and uh, getting to a place that I couldn't stop using no matter what. And and I couldn't get clean. I couldn't, um, couldn't stop. I couldn't kill myself. Uh, I finally uh, ended up with some jail time. Nothing terrible, but uh, any jail time is really terrible. I don't mean to say it like that. I've, I've never had a really good time and even one night in jail. So I mean, when I first got here, I would have said that I was in some kind of gang smuggling heroin and airplanes, but probably had I just had some bad checks is what I had. But but it was enough that I got some time and, I, and they said, you can go to a halfway house or go to jail for a while. And I spiritually made a wonderful decision. I'll go to a halfway house. And, um, but it started a life that it gave me time to stop 
and for God to start to show up in my life. And I, um, you know, remember that was, that was uh, February 2nd, 1988. I was 24. And um, my first meetings, I remember going back to, and, and the, the thing that would, would, would ring, ring for me from the past couple of years of kind of dashing in and out of a few meetings was that this is where I needed to be. And this is where I would find out what I was supposed to do with my life because I didn't know that. And, and like I said, from the early, from my earliest age, from the first memories of my life, I did not feel okay with who I was. I, I, you know, and I didn't have a horrible childhood, but, but some, some bad things went on and some, some, you know, some family issues and negativity and blah, blah, blah. But I just, for me personally, I did not know who I was or what I was going to be or what I could be. And so finding this fellowship and being introduced to this fellowship, I knew, I felt that this was where my answer was going to come from. So I started this journey at a pretty early age in, in life, really. And, um, uh, you know, without much background of anything other than drugs, drinking, and I'm a musician, and so all of that kind of life. But um, <clears throat> for me, kind of fast forward and getting here and, and then starting to work this program, I can tell you that my first couple of years in here, um, I, when I got clean, it was sort of a, a remarkable thing because I quickly lost the desire to use. And so that was a positive thing, but it was also a negative thing because I didn't work very hard. Uh, I didn't diligently dig into these steps like, like I needed to that would change me, you know, that would, would, would change who I was. And so I still, with two or three years into this fellowship, I was clean but I didn't really know who I was. I didn't really know a lot about myself. Um, ended up getting married. Not a bad thing. I have four wonderful children from that marriage, but marriage ended after 15 years in this program. And uh, it was a pretty, pretty dramatic thing. And, and, uh, uh, and the consequences of that have been pretty hard. And I look back, the only reason I really you know bring that up is, because I'm not saying I wouldn't have got married, but I think not knowing who I was and not knowing what I wanted in life, it was very hard to find the person I was supposed to be with. And that goes on and on for other things in my life, jobs that I've been involved in, um, different things. So, you know, it, it took me a lot of years, I will say, to begin to deeply dig into finding out who I was and going through that journey of step work with a sponsor and then in different areas of my life to look at what, who I was and be okay with who I was. Um, and now fast forward that, you know, around 15, 16 years after this divorce, um, I, I did. A, I, I had a sponsor before, but uh, I got a new sponsor maybe at 10 years, I think. But um, I began to dig in and do a fourth and fifth step on relationships and find out why and what, you know, made me um, have the patterns I had and, and the character defects that I had um, at 20 years or so going in and out of jobs that or careers that I would start in or think that's not really what I want to do or struggles at work. I did a fourth and fifth step on employment and, 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 you know, kind of those kinds of things in the last um, seven or eight years, you know, I've always, I've always uh, had what I would say a good relationship. Maybe I think that's okay to say with the God of my understanding of, I feel like I have a spiritual connection with my God. Um, and actually years ago, even, even more religious, but less religious today, more spiritual as time goes along and I get older and longer in this program. Um, but in the last seven or eight years, I have really diligently began to look at what I truly believe and feel in that part of my life. And it's funny that as, you know, 
I guess it's part of getting older and part of being here longer. The other things don't really matter as much. They matter less as I go along in terms of what a career is or what I'm doing for the next 20 years of my life. And it's, it's more and more important to me today is sort of what I believe and how I feel and how my higher power works in my life and how that, how I'm building on that. And that's changing. You know, I, I think the other thing for me in gaining and in, in having self-acceptance is, is realizing that number one, I'm an addict. And then, you know, number two, I'm learning all the time, you know, and if I don't use then, you know, I've, there's lots of options in my life. You know, I, I look at coming into this fellowship at uh, 24 years old and I'm 57 years old and I've, you know, been married, divorced. I have four children. Um, one of those, uh, my oldest son is uh, he actually turns 26 tomorrow. He's 25. He's been through multiple treatment centers and uh, today he's clean. Today he's doing well. Uh, but, but thinking through all of that and, and trying to imagine at 24 years old that I would live all of this life and the different jobs and the different businesses and uh, the marriage that didn't work and other relationships and trying to raise kids. And, you know, I would have thought that I can't, you know, how would I ever make it through something like that? But each part of that has really built who I am today. And, and, I, and, you know, one thing that's never changed with me, you know, I have a home group today. I've had a home group since I got clean, you know, my home group meets Tuesday, Thursday nights at seven 30 in Knoxville. And I'm active in that home group. And uh, I attend probably four or five meetings a week. I have a sponsor in Orlando, Florida named Biff, and we talk on a regular basis. And um, so what's not changed for me is 32 years of attending meetings on a regular basis and staying clean. What has constantly changed is all the things around me and my life and things with my kids, things with work. And so, you know, this, uh, in, in the learning experience that experience is that have came along with, you know, trying to do something and it not working out. Uh, and then learning from that and, and going back and saying, okay, what is it that I need to do different this time? What is it that I want to do different this time? So I think, um, you know, for me today, um, I continue to be teachable. I notice at times when I'm being hard on myself and I'm not, I don't have self-acceptance. I'm not able to say, okay, you know, that wasn't a good, good idea, but I know that, that I'm a lot better today than I ever have been. And I reluctantly say that sometimes because I think, well, you know, you should be, you know, you've been here a long time and you're old, but I think even in the last five years, I'm a lot better. So every little bit, I'm a lot better, you know, than I, than I was a year or two, two or three years before. And I see that in how I deal with situations like my son, who's trying to get clean is, and, and, and having to deal with those terrible things that go on. Like my ex-wife, who we get along great. Um, I was thinking about last night, I was at a meeting and went out to eat and um, we were talking about, you know, problems or relationships in the past and, you know, do you have resentments and anger or not get along with people you've had relationships with in the past? And honestly, I mean, probably they, they may feel differently, but I couldn't name, you know, any resentment or things that I had towards anybody. And so I think this continual growth and being willing to look at myself, being willing to continue to do step work, being willing every night to, um, to, to do a 10th step, to try to look at, I, when I first got here too, uh, my first sponsor was a, a guy named Freddie Morton who passed away with a long time plane. Freddie used to tell me all the time, you know, you need to look at your motives. You really need to be able to, to, to examine your motives and, 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 you know, look at why did you do what you did? What, what was your day about? What was this about? And what was your part in this? And, 
and what was your motive in this? And so I, I think for the most part, I'm very good at that today. Um, and, and I have a good life today because of it. You have a great relationship with all four of my children. Today's my 20, was 23, 24 as of today. And then tomorrow, my 25-year-old turns 26. I have a 21-year-old son and I have a daughter who just turned 18 is graduating high school this year. And and I'm very active in their lives, man. I and, and I wouldn't trade that for anything. And so that's a direct result of me working this program and, and ties into my own self-acceptance of looking at myself and being willing to change and being willing to to um, admit where I'm not, you know, doing the right things. I, I'm I'm very grateful and blessed that the last time I came in, I stayed. And uh, I see all these people, you know, all around me. And I know it's all around all of us that are, that are you know, the overdoses and people dying and, um, you know, not making it. It's a lot worse. I feel like it's worse than when I got here, you know. And, uh, and so I, I'm so thankful that when I, when I finally got here and stayed, I got around people who, who loved on me, you know, who told me I was okay and, uh, and told me no matter what, it would be okay. And, I think for me too, that was, that was kind of ingrained in me. And I feel that way today. I don't, I don't feel like I need to judge other people's recovery and how they do what they do. I feel like what my job is today in this fellowship is to love other people and to be there for other people and open the door for other people and chair meetings and be a part of uh, conventions. And so I'm really grateful. Um, you know, for you guys that, that are on this convention committee. And I, I hope that I can make it out to the, to the actual convention and I may try to do that. But again, I'm, I'm, you know, I would, when I got here at 24 years old, I really just wanted to stay out of jail, to be honest with you. And um, I had no idea that this would become a way of life for me and not just a way of life, but this fantastic, rich, um, experience of living and being able to um, continue to grow even when things don't go my way or when things don't work out right. You know, I can go to a meeting and I can say, hey, this is what's going on with me. And I've got everybody in the room is going to go, yeah, I know what you're talking about. That's a miracle. That's a, I, I never knew that existed, you know, and um, I can call a sponsor, you know, and share what's going on with me. And I've got this in, incredible network of people from all over the country and really all around the world that I know and can pick up a phone and call and say, Hey, how you doing? And from a little boy, you know, 10, 12 years old that was afraid and didn't have a lot of friends and was scared. And then in teenage years and terrified and drug use and jails and nobody wanted me around. And, you know, to now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the person everybody calls if there's a problem. My, my, my mother died almost a year ago. Um, and, uh, um, and, and, I, and I got to put my 32 year medallion in my mother's casket. And, uh, I'll end with this. I, I don't know where my time's at, but, you know, um, my mother, I think prayed me in here and I, you know, I literally drove her crazy for a number of years until I got clean. And, you know, my mother told me before she died, um, well, quite a while, a year or so before she died, but, you know, she's been around this fellowship with me because, you know, people coming over to her house to eat and all my friends that have got clean time, you know, she's known them as long as I have. And she used to keep all of my calendar dates on her refrigerator till the calendars covered up all of her front of her refrigerator and the side of her refrigerator. And then she quit doing it. But, you know, she told me, she said, um, you know, you could have been anything in life and I would have been proud of you. And, you know, you could have, you know, got a PhD and been a president of a bank or whatever. She said, but I'm the most proud of you for being an addict and being a part of something that you're a part of. My, my sister's got 20 years clean. I introduced to this program. Her daughter has two years clean that we introduced to this program you know, and my son's getting, my other sister's daughter has a year clean, you know, and so my mother said, you know, that, that, that this influence or this, 
miracle or this magic that flows through this fellowship that literally saves people's lives is the most, the, the, what I would have thought being an addict was what she would be the think was the worst thing after I stole everything out of her house. But she said, you know, I forgot all of that. Your first month, your first six months clean. I forgot all the bad you did. You know, for the last 31 years, all I know is the good that you've been involved in and the love that you have for other people and that people have for you. So, you know, I'm beyond grateful for this fellowship. I'm, 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 you know, God does little things uh, just like when I landed in Scottsdale I was depressed. I was going through a lot with my son, Jordan. And I thought, I don't even know how to find a meeting, but, you know, or, or will it be a good meeting? Will it have one person there? And I looked it up. I went in in this room full of this fantastic people. And then they said, well, you go out and eat with us after the meeting. And, you know, immediately everything changed from depression, from worry. To, I remembered, okay, I'm, this is my family. You know, I'm, I'm, 2000, I don't know, 2000 miles from my front door, but this is my family. So, you know, for me today, my acceptance level is good. Uh, and I do accept myself today and who I am and what I do. And the biggest thing that I know in all of my heart, if it's the last thing I ever say is I know that I'm an addict, you know, and I'm glad to be an addict. I'm grateful to be an addict. That's all I got. Awesome. Thank you very much, George. We're going to unmute everybody. Let's hear for oh, George. I thank you very much. Next up, we have Diana. Let me unmute you here. And there we go. You are good to go, Diana. Hi, everybody. My name is Diana. I'm an addict. And uh, first of all, I want to say thank you, George, for sharing your experience, strength, and hope. You did a fantastic job being asked at the last minute. Thank you so much. Um, and I also want to thank all the people that are um, in this uh, Zoom meeting and whoever's on the YouTube live. Uh, there are a lot of people on in this meeting that um, I know is here to support me and that just makes me feel so loved. And I just so appreciate um, the support that I feel from all of you. Um, I wanna thank Brenda for asking me to share my experience, strength and hope. Um, and self-acceptance is a great topic for me. Um, I was uh, reading our literature today, like I normally do before I speak. And one of the uh, pieces of literature that I was reading was out of uh, Just For Today, and um, it's for April 26th, and I'll just read the last part of it. It says, just for today, self-acceptance is a process set in motion by the 12 steps. Today, I will trust the process, practice the steps, and learn to better accept myself. And that sums it up for me. It really, really does. Um, you know, my clean date is April 23rd, 1982. I got you beat, George. I, I was 21 when I got here and uh, never thought in a, a million years that I would stay. Um, I had a, a list of ulterior motives when I arrived here. And um, I'm a firm believer that it really doesn't matter what our motives are when we get here. It, it, the key is, is staying. And, you know, I loathed myself. There was absolutely nothing about me that I liked when I first arrived here to Narcotics Anonymous. I was that addict, as, even as young as I was, I was that addict that did so many things in my active addiction that destroyed any self-esteem that I, I had or any self-acceptance that I might have had even before I picked up. You know, um, and it's taken me years around here working the steps, having a God of my understanding and having um, amazing sponsors for me to, you know, to have self-acceptance. And, you know, I, so what I normally do when I speak is I kind of do a journey of my, my clean time and my experiences on, you know, what does it really mean to have self-acceptance? And um, I can honestly remember the first time that I actually um, felt a sliver of self-acceptance. And it was the moment when I was a newcomer that I finally accepted the fact that I was an addict. 
that was huge for me because my whole entire life was a story. My whole entire life was um, deflecting off of me. I didn't want people, I mean, I held everything close to my chest. Um, I didn't let anybody in. Um, I was very much of a nomad. Um, I uh, was a loner, although I'm a twin, you know, so, I mean, I, I, I definitely am conflicted in so many, so many ways. But um, the moment that I accepted the fact that I was an addict was the, the beginning of the process for me. You know, and for me, working the steps is truly like working, um, you know, peeling away the onion, the layers. Um, I remember the first time writing on the steps. It was really a whole, not a whole lot of substance there looking back in retrospect. But for me, it was huge because I was exposing myself to another human being that I've never done before because I was so ashamed of who I was. And I was so ashamed of the things that I've done. And I, I and there was like, I loathed myself. There was absolutely nothing that I liked about Diana. Um, and I remember there's something very powerful about being witnessed. And what I mean by that is that every single time I sit down and write a step or read something or share something with my sponsor, the love that I receive um, looking, you know, with her eyes looking at me and knowing that that love is there and that, and that therapeutic value of one addict helping another is so crucial for me. It was the first um, experience I had um, having someone look at me and say, Diana, it doesn't matter what you've done. I love you anyways. You know, um, and it's those little tidbits and those beautiful moments through, through my process of recovery that I have been able to um, really find um, self-acceptance. Um, I was talking to a sponsee uh, earlier about the Zoom meetings, and I'm just gonna throw it out there. The Zoom meetings are a little difficult for me because there's such a disconnect. And I, I told her I wanted to create a button where I could push when I thought I was being funny and I, you know, and everyone would go, you know, start chuckling or push a button where, you know, you would see people's faces like, oh, that's so sad or whatever, you know. Um, so I'm having a hard time kind of connecting with the Zoom meeting and thank you. Um, uh, host with being able to see your face. It's definitely helping. Thank you. Um, but anyways, I was talking to her earlier about self-acceptance and how, um, you know, even today at 38 years clean, I still struggle with it. You know, I, I, you know, I'm really big on, on talking about the bugaboos. What are the things that haunt you? What are the things that trip you up no matter what? What are those things that you get triggered? And you know, whenever I get triggered, I go down this, this road and it's like a domino effect. And I go down this road and I'm there. I'm, I'm, I, I'm at that same place I was when I was a newcomer where I'm a piece of shit. I'm, I'm you know, list it. You know, I can give you a list of stuff that I tell myself. And what I try to do today is I turn the volume up. It's like, where is this coming from? And here's, here's the bottom line for me. In the core of my being, there is a voice that says that I have no value unless I'm fill in the blank. And it's usually being uh, of service to somebody else. Or one of the other things that I was reading on earlier was people pleasing. I'm a people pleaser. And, you know, I used to people please um, with ulterior motives because I wanted validation. I wanted to be accepted. I wanted, I wanted to hear the compliment. And, um, you know, over the years of working the steps, I've learned how to be my own cheerleader. Um, you know, George was talking about his mom uh, passing away about a year ago. My mom passed away about two years ago, and the last two years of my recovery have really been about me de digging deeper in terms of my self-acceptance. Um, my mother wasn't the mother that George had. My mother was incredibly mean to me and um, never really accepted me for who I was. I was considered the heathen 
of the family because I wasn't, um, you know, a fundamentalist Christian as she was. And Narcotics Anonymous has taught me that I'm a beautiful human being in spite of all of those things. You know, and one of the things that I've done in the last two years has done some, um, some deep um, writing and reading and praying and meditating on that very thing. It's like finding peace within myself. You know, I, um, I used to define myself based on you know, how popular I was in Narcotics Anonymous or what I did for a living or did I make a good salary or what kind of car did I drive? And I was never materialistic, but it kind of defined my, my um, success. And it also defined that, you know, I belonged in the world type of thing. Um, and it also in some ways defined who I am as a person and you know over the years working on myself it no longer defines me you know what defines me is those defining moments i've had in my life and i've had a, i've had a ton um i think it's really important for me to share a little bit about some of my experiences um, that i've had since i've been clean um you know i'm i mentioned that i'm a twin and uh, I'm an identical twin and my, I lost my twin sister behind this disease. Um, and it's still, it's still something that makes me incredibly sad. Um, and when that happened, I lost a part of myself. And through working the steps, I've been able to capture or, um, repair those parts of me that I lost um, by finding, you know, self-love and, you know, self-care and having my sponsor look me in the eye with that admiration and that love that, that happens when we work the steps with our sponsor. And then being able to find the self-love for myself. You know, so a lot of times when we think, um, you know, we have these incredible um, experiences in our lives, you know, um, it's not because we're bad people. It's life on life's terms and, you know, and really working the steps and, and uh, diving into what these steps are about is really where the healing occurs. Um, I'm a firm believer that um, we have to work these steps over and over again to get a deeper understanding of what this is all about. Because, you know, when I was a newcomer, it was, uh, what I did with my first sponsor was so crucial. But I, if I didn't continue on working the steps to be where I'm at at 38 years clean, I wouldn't have the deep understanding that I have today. I, I just wouldn't. Um, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that I remember when I was new, I would hear um, the old timers say, it's a process. And I used to hate hearing that. It's like, you know, because I, I want it all, you know, I'm that instant gratification kind of a gal, you know, and I, it, it, was, it was excruciating to, to accept the fact that working the steps and finding freedom um, from self, from this disease that we have, um, it's a process um, I'm internally grateful for today because um, what I've gone through in the last 10 years of my recovery, I would have never been able to do it um, in the first 10 years of my recovery um, or even the first 20 years of my recovery. And I was hearing the, the host talk about at 20 years clean, he's going to give up the, be the energy drinks. And I had to laugh at that. That, that was actually kind of cute um, because it, you know, there's no destination. You know, I remember when I got 10 years clean, I thought, oh man, double digits. You know, I finally arrived. And, you know, I would have old timers say that you, you don't detox until you're 20 years clean, you know? So, you know, it's just a process. So thank you for making me chuckle earlier. Um, you know, at six years, at six years clean, my first sponsor um, relapsed and that was huge for me. You know, it, she rocked my very foundation, you know, her choice of getting loaded rocked my foundation. 
um, or my thought of my foundation. And what I what I come to understand through walking through that experience is that, you know, I'm the one that does the work, you know, and it's my work that creates the foundation, not uh, not the sponsor, not not the meetings. All of that is important as pieces of the puzzle. But um, what really what really is my foundation is the work that I do through working the steps, having a, a loving God in my life and, and doing the deal. You know, and I still do the deal today. Um, and I'm and I'm grateful that um, I have found some incredible teachers along my path uh, because I really believe um, that the person that I am today is because of sponsorship and sticking with the winners and being one of the winners. Um, you know, what is self-acceptance? You know, I always thought it was um, something really simple, like, you know, I accept the fact that I'm fat or I accept the fact that I'm aging or I accept the fact of whatever. But really, it isn't that. It's, it's about learning how to love myself unconditionally in spite of my mistakes, in spite of my character defects, in spite of, um, you know, the things that goes on in between my head. Um, you know, and the six and seven step has given me so much freedom from um, from this and also having this hidden expectation on where I'm supposed to be someplace else that I'm not. Um, you know, I remember the uh, first time um, I asked one of my sponsors to sponsor me, she, um, she asked me a question. She said, Diana, where, what do you want to be remembered as when you die? And I answered the question this way. I said, I wanna be remembered as a woman that lived her life with integrity. And she literally went like this. She goes, hmm, we have a lot of work to do, don't we? You know, and, you know, and, and what she was saying is that, you know, we're idealistic people, you know, all of us, every single addict that walks into the doors of Narcotics Anonymous, wants a better life or we wouldn't be here. There would be no reason for us to step into a room if we didn't want a better better way of life. But it takes work. It takes work to have self-acceptance. It takes work to um, live in integrity. It takes work to stand in your own light. It takes work not to people please. It takes work. And sometimes it's easier to fall back in the the wallpaper and, you know, and not do anything, be a wallflower. Um, because sometimes it's not, it's not an easy thing to bring your voice forward. And that's been my struggle. I tend to uh, want to be the peacemaker and make everything all nice and pretty and the, with a bow and, you know, no conflicts. I don't like conflicts. Um, but what I have found that the only way that I can truly love myself unconditionally is by standing true to who I am as a person, you know, and being true to myself means doing, you know, the right thing for the, for the right reasons, um, you know, practicing those acts of kindness where, you know, I'm not t boasting about what I'm doing or, you know, who I'm doing it with or who I know or, you know, you know, whatever, fill in the blank, you know, whatever your thing is. Um, because I don't need, I don't need your approval if I'm living in God's will. I, I just don't, but I get glimpses of that. And it's something that I strive for. And, and some days I'm better at it than others. And, and then some days I struggle with it. And what I've come to understand through working um, several six and seven steps is that the best I'll ever be is human. So how can I find peace within myself being human? And um, I was talking to a sponsee the other day about this uh, one character defect, perfectionism. You know, perfectionism is, is an awful character defect. Um, it robs us from having freedom uh, to be ourselves. You know, it, it robs us from learning from mistakes. It robs us from asking questions or 
you know, uh, wanting to be taught, you know, or being students of life. It just robs us from a lot of things, you know. Um, <sighs> Narcotics Anonymous, I would have robbed myself um, from a lot of things if I thought it was just about staying clean or getting clean. You know, the steps are designed to go as deep as that we want them to go. I really believe that the steps can teach me, and it has. I'm, I'm proof that it's, it has taught me how to be that person that I always wanted to be, you know. And when I put my head on the pillow at night, I have a lot of respect for the person that I'm becoming. And it's a direct result of working the steps. Because when I first got here, I was a pathological liar. I, I made up stories about everything. Um, I didn't let people in my life. Um, I was really hard to get to know. And, you know, I'm not that person anymore. I'm not even close to that person. But when I get triggered, that's the first place I go. I, I go back to that place where, uh, that's, where I, that's who I am. And I'm not. I, I'm um, a beautiful, I'm a beautiful child of God, you know. One of the things that I've always done when I share is, um, I don't know where my time is, it's, it's four o'clock, so my time is pretty much coming to a close. Um, I want to share this. You know, the steps can go as deep as we want them to go. And as long as I stay on the process of the steps and having that relationship with the God of my understanding and being engaged in my personal recovery, I have a chance of um, finding deeper self-acceptance. And I have a chance of having a deeper understanding of what this is all about for me, for this addict. Um, I am so eternally grateful for my life. I have an incredible life. Um, and it has nothing to do with the job I have or the car I drive or the salary I make. It has everything to do with what I feel inside. And in order to find self-acceptance, we need to find humility, you know? And in the seventh step, it's, it's about that. It's having that humility to, you know, ask for help from, um, you know, our higher power. Help me to... Uh, restore myself, you know, and I, I believe that, um, you know, in order for me to heal from my character defects, I have to learn how to live by spiritual principles. Also in the fourth step, you know, it, it talks about our assets. And I think we have a hard time as addicts talking about what's good about us. And um, so I just want to share with you some of the things that I think is pretty amazing about me. I have a great voice. It's it's uh, deep, it's sultry, it's, you know, it's kind of a cool voice. I love my quirky sense of humor. It's very dry. Um, some people get me, some people don't, and it's okay. And I'm a loyal person. If I'm your friend, I will always be your friend, even if you don't behave. Um, and that's, that's just who I am. I'm a solid person. I'm a great sponsor. I'm a great sponsee. I'm a wonderful friend. I have um, integrity. I am that woman that lives in integrity. And I have so many people in my life that love me. And what the gift is, is that today I know how to receive that love. And by receiving that love from my sponsor and from the women that I sponsor and from my friends, I've been able to learn how to love myself. And today I'm able to look at myself in the mirror and have admiration for the things that I've overcome, for the, um, the life that I live and, uh, and the person that I am. Um, I really believe that Narcotics Anonymous um, is a miracle and I'm a miracle. Um, and we're all miracles. And today I am a winner. I don't hang with the winners. I am a winner. And um, I just want to thank Brenda for asking me to uh, share today. I really appreciate you asking. I, I, I felt, I hopefully you, you were able to connect with me sharing because, you know, this is very different. Um, 
And I hope that uh, somebody is leaving this uh, workshop today with a message. And I hope I touch somebody. And you touched me by asking me. And I really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you, Diana. All right, I'm going to unmute. Let's hear it. Yay. 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 Awesome. Thank you very much. And thank you again to George and Diana for sharing their experience, strength, and hope, as well as everybody else who's been of service during this meeting. Um, before closing our meeting, um, I have asked Jimmy F. to read We Do Recover. Maya will be putting it up here. And I'm going to unmute you there and give us one second. We'll get that listed for you. There we go. Hi, I'm Jimmy. I'm an act. <clears throat> we do recover. When at the end of the road, we find that we can no longer function as a human being, either with or without drugs, we all face the same dilemma. What is there left to do? There seems to be this alternative, either go on the best we can to the bitter ends, jails, institutions, or death, or find a new way to live. In years gone by, very few addicts ever had this last choice. Those who are addicted today are more fortunate. For the first time in man's entire history, a simple way has been proving itself in the lives of many addicts. It is available to us all. This is a simple spiritual, not religious program known as Narcotics Anonymous. Awesome. Thank you, Jimmy. All right. And again, thank you, everybody, for participating and being here for this workshop. Um, as I was saying, we uh, have been live streaming this to YouTube. And immediately after this, all of those, um, the live stream, I will cut it down into the actual uh, meeting itself. So anybody who wasn't able to get into the meeting or would like to watch that, please do so. Um, I know we did hit our capacity and I, I did hear that there were some people that weren't able to get into the meeting. If anybody is contacting somebody who's in the meeting saying, hey, I can't get in, please guide them over to youtube.com, searching for ARCNA 34 Zoom and they'll be able to watch on there. Um, we are going to be on break until 5 p.m. when it will be time for our main speakers. Um, if you are wanting to be a reader, uh, please uh, hop back in here about quarter till so we can assign readings. Um, the, uh, the meeting will stay active, um, but we will just not be here. So after a moment of silence for the addicts still sick and suffering, both inside and outside of these virtual rooms, we will close with the third step prayer. Everyone will stay muted, so please follow along yourself. Many of us have said, take my will and my life, Guide me in my recovery and show me how to live. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>